All right, so let's just begin by uh, just taking a few moments to quieten our minds and settle down and settle in. And just uh, bring your mind to the present moment. It's making your mind quiet, being in this room, being in this space, being in your body, being on your cushion. Allowing yourself to breathe Breathe out and let go of all the days and weeks activity. Allowing yourself to put it aside for just this hour. Not having to carry the burden of keeping the world going. Allowing yourself to relax. To tune in to yourself. Tune in to your body and your mind. Hear what is going on. So slowly coming back to the present moment and uh, preparing your mind to tune into the word of the Buddha, tune into the profundity and the, the practicality of, his, of the teachings. seeing how we can relate it to our lives, live by it, and learn what true happiness is. So 
When you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes. Okay, so, so as uh, Manori uh, mentioned, and those who haven't been here for a while or have missed a few, we're um, still on the book Social and Communal Harmony, and we're on the chapter on establishing an equitable society. So, um, Chi here mentioned last week that last week um, we started on a very interesting uh, chapter. And it was right at the end, like when everybody's brain was turning off. So she suggested that we go through the, pre the sutta that we did the last time, just go the, the very last sutta that we did the last time, um, that we start with that. And because the next few suttas relate to that very interesting and cause of great conflict and suffering in this world, money. <laughs> so I'll just uh, start with that last sutra again, ways of seeking wealth, and we can uh, expand on it because the two sutras after that are also what the Buddha um, uh, what the Buddha, Buddha taught about um about wealth so uh, so here we go so. the householder who seeks wealth righteously without violence and makes himself happy and pleased and shares it and does meritorious deeds and uses that wealth without being tied to it, infatuated with it and blindly absorbed in it. Seeing the danger in it and understanding the escape, he may be praised on four grounds. The first ground on which he may be praised is that he seeks wealth righteously without violence. The second ground on which he may be praised is that he makes himself happy and pleased. The third ground on which he may be praised is that he shares the wealth and does meritorious deeds. The fourth ground on which he may be praised is that he uses his wealth without being tied to it, infatuated with it, and blindly absorbed in it. Seeing the danger in it and understanding the escape, the householder may be praised on these four grounds. Just as from a cow comes milk, from milk curd, from curd butter, from butter ghee, and from ghee comes cream of ghee, which is reckoned the foremost of all these, so among all householders, the foremost, the best, the preeminent, the supreme, and the finest is the one who seeks wealth righteously, without violence, and having done so, makes himself happy and pleased and shares the wealth and does meritorious deeds and uses that wealth without being tied to it infatuated it with it and blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger in it and understanding the escape. So that is an extremely rich sutta because it talks about how to earn money that is without violence, 
how to live with money without becoming infatuated with it, without becoming, what is it? Blindly absorbed in it. And seeing the danger in it. Mm. And understanding the escape. And also how to spend it. How to, how to, how to, uh, yeah, how to, uh, yeah, how to spend it. Because, well, this is the thing, isn't it? Money is how we can, it is, it is sort of, can be used for great things and it can be used for terrible things. It can, it is the source of being generous, open-handed and, and, uh, uh, enriching others' lives, and it can also be the source of families breaking up, of in enormous amounts of conflict, and uh, um, somehow we also define ourselves by who we are, don't we? We we kind of say, oh, he's a he, he lives in a house that is oh, our new neighbor lives in a house that is extremely large. See, you tell you say. Straight away, you don't say, oh, he's a nice guy. You say he lives in a really large house. Um, and we um, also think all our, in a way, our suffering is solved by money. Like if like if you listen to the news, you uh, uh, hear, well, you know, if the government spent more on healthcare, everything will be all right. If the government spent more on Mental health, everything will be all right. So we kind of think that money also is the uh, solution to our problems. So money is somehow we are uh, uh, defined by it and we think the problems in the world will be solved by it. But uh, so this is something extremely like the Buddha says, danger and escape. It is something that is... Uh, uh, so close to us that it is the source of of um, uh, great suffering, the source of being caught up in the sense world, and it is also the source of escape. So just starting that off, I thought um, uh, I thought perhaps. Oh yes, 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 yes. So we talked about this last time. She was asking what is meant by the escape from it. So the word, the term um, danger and understanding the escape is very often, in fact, only I'm not sure, used in the context of sensual pleasures. The Buddha talks about the danger in sensual pleasures and the escape from sensual pleasures. And that is uh, um, repeated so many times, but the escape from sensual pleasures is the noble eightfold path. And right livelihood is part of it, isn't it? How we earn our money and how we spend our money is part of uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, one of eight factors. So he does an eighth, eighth of our, our, uh, our practice is um, right livelihood. We kind of spend a lot of time talking about meditation and mindfulness and, you know, this technique and that technique, but one eighth of the Noble Eightfold Path is right livelihood, interesting. So not to be underestimated how we, um, how we earn our wealth, how we live with our wealth and how we uh, relate to others with wealth because it can be a source of um, enabling somebody else. You know, when you um, uh, donate or when you help somebody who doesn't have money, 
Uh, and it also can be, uh, yeah, it can be, it's a tool. It's a tool. So just, uh, uh, I officially don't, I don't have money. So, and yet we need it even as monastics. You have to have a roof over your head. Ideally, we'd be living under a tree in India, but uh, it'd be a bit cold if I lived under a tree. It'd be fairly miserable if I lived under a tree in England. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so monastics also have to manage wealth and there's a lot of uh, vineyard rules around how projects are handled, how uh, money is spent in the monastery, how it's, yeah, a whole lot of vineyard rules. But we won't go into that. So I will just stop there and see uh, what people have to say on this um, sometimes very difficult topic. Fortunately, we are the type, we are, we all have a roof over our heads, which is why we can have a computer and be sitting here at seven o'clock at night. So we're already very fortunate. Um, yeah, so yes, I think Susie. Susie, yes, may I ask you to unmute, please? Hi, <clears throat> Venerable. Hello, um, Susie. Hello. Um, I was thinking about how the use of wealth can be contribute contribute well to society. So, like, how monastics are like a major part of like Buddhist society. And um, I was thinking about Anfa Pindaka. Is Anatha that Pindaka. Anatha. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, he was a ma major contributor. So, right. um, we just think about his merit in in contributing so well to the Buddhist. Um, uh. You know, so I was thinking, like, what would what would the merits be behind such um, actions be, like helping yeah. support, support monastics? Well, that's true. I mean, the Buddha talks very often about support. In fact, the next sutta, number five, uh, one of the five ways of using wealth is by so specifically he talks about so supporting monastics, so supporting a set ascetics and um, uh, people who will teach you the Dhamma essentially in yeah yeah well it's specifically for that reason they teach you the Dhamma it's 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 the Dhamma is the highest source of happiness thank goodness for knowing the Dhamma and it is often the the um, the monastics who have the uh, who have devoted their life to it, who are the custodians in a way of the word of the Buddha. They have preserved it for thousands of years in, in monasteries. So it is in this country, I guess, nobody thinks about it, but in Sri Lanka and in, and in traditional Buddhist countries, supporting monastics is for good or for bad, uh, a, taught to be the highest source of merit. So um, people will go all out to support a monastery. They wouldn't be feeding the beggars down the street, but they'd be having huge dhanas for uh, 10, 20 already very well-fed monastics. Sorry, I'm a bit being a bit cynical, but um, yeah, it is. it has been misconstrued sometimes, but... It, yeah, it is a it is wonderful to have people who who teach the Dhamma because it is for our benefit. I just wanted to touch upon um, this part of the Pali Canon I've been reading. Yeah, I've read the Vivimana Vatu. All right, yes, it's my favorite part of the Pali Canon um, because it talks about generosity so much. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I'll leave it to another day the topic so okay we'll leave that for another topic we'll leave that for another topic um yes and anybody else oh Gunther himself yeah it's uh, really that I speak when I co-host um <laughs> I think um, I mean I like that sutta very much yeah mm. because it's very practical mm. for me uh, mm. um and I think it says um the householder who seeks wealth mm. righteously. Mm. One aspect is also, in my opinion, that you 
writer's list, fine, but many people have jobs they don't really want. They would like to do something else. And I think not in that sense possibly what it's talking about, but it's also important to to be happy in, in getting money right, right, yeah. instead of we have to get. I mean, mm. you know, it, it's part of the system. The system itself, it's a tool, as you said. Money is not of any value, really. Mm. It's it's a tool in, in exchange and everything historically. Mm. Um, and um, to get it should also be a, a fulfilling thing uh, because yeah. uh, this causes other problems. Uh, and secondly, I think it's uh, it points out that you should use the money. And I think in our times of the capitalist area, if mm. I may mention, one of the problems is the big companies who just bank it in Panama, in Jersey Island and everywhere else. That money, even if you would like to use it, causes much more problems in society because it's not it's not doing anything it's 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 um mm. a dead dead uh, tool in that sense instead of circulating and 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 getting to the people and the buy and and the economy goes up mm. well i don't think anybody here has money in panama <laughs> <laughs> no but you know the amazon or, or <laughs> <laughs> But but on your first point, uh, that for a lot of people, their the way they earn money is, however, it just seems so stressful. Anybody you ask, how's how's life? They always go, oh, they're so busy. They're just so tired. They're so tired from work. You know. Um, well, what can you what can you what can you do about that? I mean, I have this most amazing job, so. Uh, not everybody has amazing jobs like this. What um, perhaps if in in anyone has something to say on earning money through righteously, but also in a way that is giving a service. You know, you are doing it as a as not as I've got to get this done so that my boss is happy. I was we were talk. I was talking to Chi the other day, but if we can somehow think of our work as a, 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 a gift, you know, you're helping somebody in society. society. Yes, yeah, Shirley. Shirley, may I ask you to unmute, please? Yeah, I mean, I've been retired for nearly 20 years now. I mean, I actually retired before I got my pension. Because although I did a job that I, I loved, I wanted to do social work, I wanted to help people. I didn't care about making wealth, I wanted to serve. Um, and But sometimes the job became very difficult and very stressful. And towards the end, I mean, actually, I think I was quite ill. I think I was on the verge of a breakdown and I'd drive to work and I'd be in, sometimes I'd be crying, I'd be sort of counting the almost count the days. Anyway, fortunately, before I could actually leave. Mm. And because of various conditions, I just felt rubbish. I couldn't have applied for another job at that time. I mean, I'm going back 20 years. I don't feel like this anymore. Mm. So please don't worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think over the last 20 years, I've got developed a lot more meta for myself. And, you know, my practice has, has strengthened the way I feel about myself, but I just felt rubbish. I could have never applied for a job because I just felt wow. like rubbish. And I think there must be many people like that. And I don't know what the answer is. I yeah, think, yeah. I, think yeah. um, I think the Buddha says wonderful things about when about employers looking after their workers. Mm. And this doesn't seem to happen anymore. And I know, I mean, I know it's got worse since I left left work. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I don't know what to say to those of you who are working in stressful jobs and having to continue. I just mm. feel, um, I just don't know what the answer is. And I'm just um, 
feel so fortunate that I've got this money coming in and I don't have to have mm. to do anything for it. Um, but it's, I, you know, I don't know, because, but it is a great joy if one can have a job one enjoys and can, can serve. But mm. if it's a job that's stressful and then maybe worse of all, if you're stuck in a job that's um, that's unethical. Mm. I mean, at least I knew my job. Well, I was never asked to do anything unethical ever in my work. Mm. And what do you do? Uh, it's, uh, I suppose it's that we live in Sansara and I suppose it's just Dukkha, you know, but I don't see the answer to this because I think many people are unhappy in their work and it's all very well to say, yes, we should be happy in our work, mm. but conditions don't make it like that for some people. Mm. So, so much better to and compassion to all of you who are working in stressful jobs, and that's all I can really say. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is either. Uh, Liz, Liz, may I ask you to unmute, please? Mm. Hi, I, I have two two careers, and they were all very difficult. I was a nurse, and then I was a psychology teacher. And uh, you're absolutely right. This seems to be so ethical, so wonderful. You're serving the community. You're marvelous. But you got to a stage where I wasn't serving myself, where I was so tired. I worked, when I was teaching, I, I worked, I don't know, 12, 14 hours a day. And, uh, and that was just too much. So I decided to cut my hours, and that was really strange because uh, my boss said, but you can't leave. You're not going to earn as much as you do. And I said, yeah, but now my children are, are blessed. They're adults. I don't need much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you don't seem to understand. She said, you're not going to earn as much as they look <laughs> I do understand. I don't want, I don't need this money. I have enough with less hours. But that didn't make me popular at all. Oh, I have to face a lot of disapproval. Oh, you know. oh really? Uh, yes. And uh, so I used to have the Thursday off. And I used to go to a Mavarati because I lived near Mavarati for many, mm -hmm. many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, the, the, at the beginning, it was just, so what did you do in a very sarcastic tone? What did you do on your day off? <laughs> oh, I went to a variety. <laughs> uh, you can imagine their face. Oh. <laughs> Herself is somewhere, but she's gone mad, you know. It was really, it was difficult at the beginning, but then, you know, they gave up hope mm. and yeah, that, that was okay. <laughs> uh, uh. It, it was strange because I think uh, what I, I, the way I understood the situation is we are so conditioned. Mm -hmm. in wanting as much money as we can mm -hmm. get. That when somebody challenges you, challenges your view, not by saying anything, but by doing something which is not the, uh, which challenges your, your view, you've got to get as much money as mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there is pressure, there is uh, they don't like it. I uh, and I, I left because of Brexit, and I left uh, well four years before I should have retired. Mm. And I had to face the same disapproval. You know, it was uh, mm, it was interesting. So I think you know we say people even in ethical jobs there is this pressure from society. To make money, you know, mm -hmm. right. and if we don't right. question it, we right. become prisoners as well. Right, right, yes. Mm. Isn't yes that was an interesting experience. Yes, a very interesting experience. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You you think okay? Now that I have uh, fifty thousand, fifty I don't know fifty thousand in the bank, I'll be all right. 
but then you get fifty thousand in the bank and you go, well, once I I don't know, have a hundred thousand in the bank, I'll be all right. So where is the limit? I, I heard once it was a journalist, but I can't remember the name of the person who was talking about. It was an old journalist, and he was saying that he was amazed. He uh, interviewed one of the richest person in the world, and he said to him, "Bro, don't you think you have enough? You could have a rest instead." And apparently, he replied, yeah. "Well, just a little bit more." Wow. <laughs> and I thought that is a danger. That is a danger. Oh. Gosh. Okay, just a minute. Manori has something and then Chi has something. Yeah, that is the so true. Mm. Just, yeah. Yes, Manori. Yeah. So hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, so going back, going back to the avoiding wrong livelihood, like, you know, it kind of looks quite simple saying, okay, mm -hmm. trading in weapons, trading in mm -hmm. living beings, this is not an old thing, there's modern slavery even now, um, trading in meat, trading in intoxicants and trading in poisons, mm -hmm. but then... Um, in the modern day, you know, we might think, okay, we are, our company is not doing that. Right. But, you know, there are things like, mm -hmm. say, if your company has a lot of money, you're investing mm -hmm. in, um, in the shares. Are you investing in, um, you sure. know, companies who do these things? So uh, mm -hmm. there are ways that uh, you tell the investment managers and they'll remove them. I, um, Church of England does that, and uh, in my organization does that. It's like ethical investing. So are yeah, we, yeah. we don't want, we, we know that we get more money if we invest, but mm -hmm. don't do that because we don't want it. But then you kind of think, is a supermarket a bad place? But then the supermarket's um, revenue, you know, um, alcohol and cigarettes are much, much smaller. So we kind of consider, okay, a supermarket is a good place. So kind of it's it's, it's not that black and white like mm -hmm. long ago uh, when it comes to today's things. And also there are organizations like private companies who kind of, you know, push the people, mm -hmm. you know, for the commissions and you know and you kind of targets and if not you'll kick off you get bullied you know wow. it's like that that wow. that ethics you know it gets it gets kind of you know wider and bigger yeah. and we need to think a lot of it um yeah. just like you know not that black and white these five okay i'm fine but um there, there's more to it to think isn't it right right I, I mean, it is very difficult to be in this human realm and not cause suffering in some um, way or another, directly or indirectly. So I think that perhaps what one has to, in this case, is where we are directly causing harm. So at, to the greatest of our ability, buying ethical investments, not um, um, being involved in companies that, you know, are um, enslaving, enslaving workers in Africa, whatever it is. Uh, but directly that your activities during the day is not harmful because that's what most affects our mind when we have spoken harshly, when we have um, hurt another being. So, the, yeah, that, I, that that's what we can most have control over it, control over. Anyway, Chi has something to say. Mm, so more of a question. Um... Yeah. I think was I uh, recently we watched a Dhamma talk where um, Ajahn Brahm was talking about work and he was pointing out that we should remember that mm. work is the, the cause of suffering <laughs> mm. and it's actually 
us who um, which is a very deep thing to say mm. it's uh, all the suffering is coming from us but I, I also wondered um how to fit that in a work context like a, mm. not in a monastic setting because mm. it can feel like maybe you're starting to mm be too easy on your employer maybe it was very unfair by saying oh you know the suffering is just from mm, me yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how to kind of balance the two mm. knowing that the cause of suffering is kind of uh, from an internal mm. thing but mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> trying to have an equitable workplace yes yes yeah. yes yes I think it's the attitude with which you say you uh, say your boss wasn't being very equitable. Yeah, it was like causing you stress or suffering. Ca- causing you stress or suffering. Um, how you respond, how you speak to them isn't like, you're causing me a lot of suffering and get out of my face. But may I help you to understand that the way you are behaving is not of uh, benefit to this workplace. You know, so you're saying it out of compassion rather than um, you're doing the wrong thing. So it's important to speak up, not just sort of sit there like a like a doormat. I th- I think, but you're you're right. Ultimately, we can't change our workplace. We can't change our uh, the people who we work with, but we can ex we can work with our own minds and have compassion. Um, and understand that all beings are just mired by delusion. They, they, are, they really don't know what they're doing. They're just doing what they think they should be doing. So yes, the more that we are able to un, to, to um, withdraw from the sense world, understand the sense world is ultimately suffering the more that we can be at ease at work with our colleagues, with our bosses, um, at ease in the world, if that makes any sense. Mm. Yeah, it's it's hard, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, any any other comments? Oh, Richard is waving his hand, his real hand. You can, oh, Richard is, is, is I ask you to unmute? What? Yeah, hi. Um, hi, hello. Um, oh, basically, Richard. as far as, um, far as work is concerned, I mean, like, in a, I mean, my last job I had, I was working as a steward. I was mm-hmm. working in um, Wembley Stadium, and I was mm-hmm. working with a manager. And this manager, you know, was actually trained, you know, when he was from very young, when he worked in a certain very high, um, you know, shop, you know, in in a in a. And sorry, Sandra Sutton. So this, you know, this manager, he was some, um, was sort of trained by his mother to work in a very high level shop in the West End, mm. in London. And his mother's attitude basically was mm. the main idea every day is really to be of service mm. to the customer. Wow. You know, and that's actually a very good attitude. And myself, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, before I was a steward. Um, I used to be a waiter. I was actually a, a um, hospitality um, silver service banqueting waiter. So I've oh. worked in five star hotels. I've yeah. worked in, you know, private clubs, play, you know, in all these sorts of establishments. Um, you know, basically all over places all over in London. And it actually does, um, you know, I mean, their emphasis in that kind of work is actually to try and be a service mm-hmm. to the customer. Mm-hmm. And even by contrast, when I actually worked in a very low company, one called Primark, for example, their attitude was the same thing. 
and mm. I actually found that it's actually very helpful. It's very helpful to the mind, and it's actually mm. very helpful with the Eightfold Path. And it all corresponds because I also found that um, because I have a partial interest in um, Tibetan Buddhism, partially interested in that as well. And one of their principles is actually to be able to try to be of benefit to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something what they used to recommend is that when you go to work in the morning or evening, you know, what you do is you try to imagine that all your customers are actually Buddhas. And so even if you want to kill them, <laughs> you a machine gun and kill everybody on the shop floor, you know, <laughs> and kill them all, you know, throw hand grenades and kill everybody, because they're all absolutely pain in the bum. But they're actual Buddhas. So they're all your wonderful teachers, and they're there to help you, teach you to develop patience and love and kindness, not only to them, but to yourself. Right. So they're actually your guru, wow. you know, that are helping you to develop as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a really nice, I find it very nice um, sort of attitude to work with. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so what, with my last job, um, I, when I was working in Wembley Stadium, you know, like I said, I bumped into this manager and he was, like I said, he was trained by his mother mm -hmm. to, from a very young age. Well, he's in his 50s now. And, um, you know, he had the same attitude. And it was just really nice to work with people like this. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it is easy to do, but it's actually very insightful mm -hmm. as well, you know. Okay. Because it actually does actually um, bring up, it's very good for practice, you know. It's very good to, mm -hmm. you know, these, your, your customer is your guru. Yeah. Quite literally. Yeah. So, you know, and it's quite an ethical job to do if, mm -hmm. you know, you're following in an ethical way of work and you're, money, you're earning money if you have to earn money. So That's you're true. earning money in an ethical way. You're being of service to people. So, you know, whatever job you do, if you do go there mm -hmm. with an attitude in the morning or evening or nighttime of looking upon these people or... Mm -hmm as like a Buddha, or, or, you know, and try to and not be a doormat. And I, I don't say, you know, you have to be a doormat to these people. You know, not saying that. I mean, just simply saying that it is nice to have, it does actually help to also say no as well. But um, the general, it's very good emotionally and psychologically to go with an attitude of trying to look upon your mm. job as, a, as an offering and it's a spiritual practice in itself mm. as part of the eightfold path so i find that's quite for myself when mm. i used to work because mm. i've just given up work now because i've just retired mm. i mean i still would like to go to work but i can't anymore because i'm not allowed to because um someone else now pays my rent <laughs> so i'm not allowed to work <laughs> Shame, you know, because I enjoyed my job. But um, now I've got all this free time, and it's really nice. <laughs> so, uh, it's really well, thank you, thank you anyway, Richard, for yeah. that very inspiring uh, sharing. A great reminder. And Joel says as well, I work as a nurse in a psychiatric ward. Wealth makes me able to don't have to care about working for an enough salary just for the happiness of working, serving others. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank Yeah. So on that very beautiful note, we will continue and go on to the next one, next two. Actually, the one after that is the one that's also very interesting, how to use wealth. So we'll read the next is number four quickly because we, we don't tend to trade in meat or living beings, but we have. Okay, so number four, avoid avoiding wrong livelihood. Monks, a lay follower should, follower should not engage in these five trades. What five? 
trading in weapons, trading in living beings, trading in meat, trading in intoxicants, and trading in poisons. A lay follower should not engage in these five trades. So um, we kind of briefly touched on that with Manori's point about we may not do it directly, but we may be instigating it by who we invest with or who uh, companies invest with. So um, if Anybody has uh, anything to say about that? Yeah. Oh, Susie, yes. Susie, may I ask you to unmute, please? I was in a discussion with some other Buddhists mm. recently, and um, somebody asked the group, uh, can I be a bartender? Because, mm. not me laughing, but somebody else. And we came to the conclusion that it was selling intoxicants. Mm -hmm. So a lot of common jobs nowadays, right. um, we rely on things such as selling alcohol, selling, um, mm -hmm. dealing with possibly um, veterinary work even. Like um, it could be, it's, it's a very black, it's not very black and white as Minori said, it's very grey area um, depending on what field of work you do. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering... Um, what would what would be the big big jobs that you think would be asked a question? Gee, you're asking the wrong person. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you anyway. Uh, well, uh, I I really don't know. I, I've been living in a monastery for fifteen years. So I don't even know what kind of jobs are there anymore. There's like some, all kinds of, yes, tea. Yeah. I can, I can offer an example. Um, yeah. I had a friend who applied for a job as a data analyst mm. and it seemed quite safe. Okay, I'm just a data analyst. But mm. once she started working, actually, the data analytics were about uh, selling wine, mm. uh, figuring out which, you know, which, people to target and mm. but basically it right, was maximizing right, right, right. profit for a company to sell wine right so right. I think in this day and age you uh, you you might have to be very yeah. uh, thorough and yeah. actually do a bit of an investigation mm. it's, it's more difficult I think because mm. the job titles uh, don't necessarily say mm. it all mm. so, wow Right. Then she had to you know, think, okay, I'm a Buddhist, so I need to get a mm, new job and go through mm. the application process. Right, again. right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. I but, guess the point is to value your Buddhist values over uh, the convenience of this job and say, okay, I'm going to put my, I'm going to put the Dhamma ahead, ahead of continuing with this probably well-paid job and quit and do something else because yeah you value your va you value your values madeline madeline may i ask you to unmute please i was just going to just add in two points worth don't trade in weapons that's what i would suggest is the most important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking what job should i not get involved in or in um, killing animals. So mm -hmm. for me, those would be the two top um, top jobs to avoid. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, Benjamin. Benjamin, may I ask you to unmute, please? Hello. Uh, so I was just thinking um, about on, on the point of for instance, the data analyst thing being mm. involved in wine, I think you have to be really careful whatever job you do. Because, for example, my trade is piano tuning. And what could be unethical about tuning a piano, right? <laughs> but I have to be really careful when I'm buying uh, materials because mm. some of the glues are made from animals or things like that. You have to really mm. do a lot of research in any job just to avoid those sorts of things. Mm. And then a point on the 
not trading in weapons mm. that just occurred to me is mm. in the West, there's a lot of overlap between people who are interested in Buddhism and people who are interested in martial arts. And mm. I'm wondering what's the, uh, what are the implications for someone who runs a martial arts shop and sells weapons for sport rather than for use as weapons like for instance my my own mother mm. has a a wooden sword for practicing tai chi with mm. um, <laughs> but technically she bought that from someone trading in weapons but obviously on the understanding that they're not going to be used for harming so just mm. something that occurred to me mm. Well, I guess it would depend on the intention of the person who was selling those weapons. Are they using it for someone to be uh, uh, practicing martial arts, um, not necessarily going out on the streets and using it in a violent way? Yeah. You always have curly questions, Benjamin. <laughs> um, yes, it really depends on one's intention, isn't it? What is your intention in um, having such a shop, in buying such an object? Uh, are you using it just to, you know, gain a skill, get some exercise? You're not necessarily going to be using that in for real. Um, I think most people just practice martial arts just as, as a form of a, of a skill, really, rather than how often will they ever use it in self-defense, quite honestly, very rarely, isn't it? Um, leave alone actively injuring somebody, even rarer. So, yeah. Yes, I think Leo was next. Yeah. Leo, may I ask you to unmute, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think the point Benjamin raised is a really interesting one. And I think that overlaps with the intoxicant one in terms of what mm. is the gray area and what isn't. And mm. I guess it also, I mean, there's a sense of like the scale to which your consumption is or the seller is like invested in and like how bad it is like if if you're working for an alcohol company and it's you're genuinely just selling alcohol and you're data trading to make the most profit out of wine or something like that that is quite an intense mm -hmm. way to be involved in the selling or trade of intoxicant generally but then if you're a bartender and you're just trying to make your rent and you don't serve people that are too intoxicated then you're doing your job with compassion right and I think in terms of martial art, for example, there's there's a there's an interesting overlap with that in terms of how much of it do you do out of compassion? And is training in martial art for defense being compassionate to yourself? And and to yourself, like in case you, you know, happen to be attacked by someone, or like how much of it is like being compassionate to yourself so that you feel safe when you walk in the street or whatever and so there's a sense of being compassionate for others but for yourself as well and also but yeah it, I think it is an interesting point and I think on the point of like not just tr like working but also consuming in those areas there's also I think it's so much I mean I'm thinking of Palestine, but there is so much that we buy, for example, from companies and they're investing in Israeli weapons. And like how like that is mm -hmm. much worse than buying a wooden sword to <laughs> practice Tai Chi, like in my opinion. And like it's just looking into the right places, I think. And sometimes it's hidden behind and it, it requires research, which is annoying to do. But I guess that is also... Uh, our role as lay people to be right, right. into that and trying to live in a compassionate way. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good point. And um, Liz adds there one thing when we mean we might need to add to the list of jobs which damage the environment, e.g., oil companies. So as much as we can, doing the research, even though, like you said, you're it's it's annoying. 
uh, before who are we going to invest, where are we going to invest to the greatest of our ability. Yeah. And you're right. It's a scale, isn't it? Are you uh, just mildly involved or are you, <laughs> that's your job. So, yes, very good point. Susie. Susie, may I ask you a note, please? So what Benjamin was on about and Leo, two things. Um, I was thinking about like the weapon use. It's like maybe like a knife. That's like you can use it for like a, like a, like cooking or like culinary work. So you could chop a tomato, but you could use it as a weapon as well. And, that, and one thing as well, um, possibly like an environmental damage. Like maybe that could come under poisons. Mm. True. Like treating poisons, um, because we us Britons have like a really bad case of um, mm. sewage. I'm just like, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll I'll digress, but um, basically, a lot of things that we we think is like black and white is mm. sometimes based on intent. So, like, say if like you were to get a baseball bat you can hit someone with a baseball bat but you can also use it to play sports it's all about the action behind like the mind frame of somebody using such objects mm -hmm. um yeah anyway yes 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 thank you yes thank you and sometimes you don't know when you're selling your baseball pet that they are going to go out and bludge somebody with it uh. And you could be selling knives and all they were doing is chopping tomatoes. So, yeah, hard, hard, to, know. hard to know. I guess we have the, those that we obviously know are going to cause harm. Like, um, like uh, I don't know, working for a data analyst that is analyzing wine company sales. Yeah. Um, so we have come to like 7.45 and I was actually wanting to do this other sutta, uh, uh, but that is also like a really important sutta, which is how to spend money, the proper use of wealth. So we can, uh, how about um, we read it and then we can do it again next week. Like, so we have, we sort of, sort of contemplate the spending end of money because that is also a great source of suffering and a great source of um, uh, happiness as well. So we'll just read it and then we can redo it again next week. How's that? Yes. Okay. All right. The proper use of wealth. The Blessed One said to the householder Anatha Pindika, Householder, there are these five utilizations of wealth. What are the five? Here, householder, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteous wealth, righteously gained, the noble disciple makes himself happy and pleased and properly maintains himself in happiness. He makes his parents happy and pleased and properly maintains them in happiness. He makes his wife and children his servants, workers, and helpers, happy and pleased, and properly maintains them in happiness. This is the first utilization of wealth. Again, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteously gained, the noble disciple makes his 
friends and companions, happy and pleased, and properly maintains them in happiness. This is the second utilization of wealth. Again, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteously gained, the noble disciple makes provisions with his wealth against the losses that might arise because of fire or floods, kings or bandits, or unloved heirs. He makes himself secure against them. This is the third utilization of wealth. Again, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteously gained, the noble disciple makes the five oblations to relatives, guests, ancestors, the king, and the deities. This is the fourth utilization of wealth. Again, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of his arms, earned by the sweat of his brow, righteously gained, the noble disciple established, establishes an uplifting offering of arms, an offering that is heavenly, resulting in happiness, conducive to heaven, to those ascetics and Brahmins who refrain from intoxicants, intoxication and heedlessness, who are settled in patience and mildness, who tame themselves, calm themselves, and train themselves for Nibbana. This is the fifth utilization of wealth. So that is a very practical and uh, methodical uh, sutta that tells us where to start spending our money and where to finish spending our money, what is important, what is less important. And uh, interestingly also, supporting monastics, as Susie said, right in the beginning, because not just any monastic, but ones who are refraining from intoxication and heedlessness, who are settled in patience and mildness, who tame themselves, calm themselves, and train themselves for Nibbana. So not every Tom, Dick, or Harry monk, whatever that is. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we have uh, such a short time left, um, but um, uh, let me just read what Susie said. Susie just wanted to add something just because society is a certain way doesn't mean we can work together to solve problems. I think advances in medicine is a great example. Okay, true. Thank you. Uh, and Shirley. May I ask you to unmute Shirley? Sorry, I was trying to find my cursor. Um, <laughs> um, there's one thing that really jumps out at me, and it's been jumping out, and it's been sort of bugging me all evening. <laughs> it's a big subject, and I yeah. wanted to raise it now because I'm not sure that I'll be able to come next week, oh. and maybe you'll be able to talk about it and I'll be able to listen to the recording. Right. We're um, actually not having our class next week because we're moving exactly <laughs> next Friday, so you can... We can okay. Go and yes. then I'll, I'll, the week after. Yeah. So I just wanted to flag up 
there's nothing about helping the hungry or the thirsty. Right. People, there's absolutely nothing there. Good. And I think we have, if we've got enough, if we've got more than enough, yeah. we've got an absolute duty to do that first of all, if to help those in need. Yeah. And it just it almost made me want to change my religion and become a Muslim because I know that yeah. Muslims aren't supposed mm -hmm. to eat if they know that there's somebody hungry in their town which is a beautiful teaching mm. so i just wanted to throw that out i don't right. think we've got time to address it but right. that's something we can address yes, next yes, week yes, yes, what yes. is iris you know and i sort of think about this i you know i try and support mm. the, the the monastics mm. but i also think you know there are that there are a lot of people who are hungry yeah. even in this I country do. now and, yeah. and um yes so i think that's yeah. it and, and certainly in other countries um and mm. i think there's a lot of work done i mean bhikkhu bodhi set up buddhist global relief mm. for example and does very good work so it's just something i wanted to flag up but i'm not expecting it to be addressed mm. today because there's not time and i've spoken enough right 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 to a very uh, re quick response to that was from Manori said, there are other suttas. There may be other suttas supporting giving to the needy. So sometimes a sutta is just um, spoken to, relevant to that particular uh, uh, person who the Buddha was speaking to, that particular uh, episode. So it's not always an all-encompassing list. So that could be that could be a helpful answer. Yes, Liz. Yes, may I ask it on mood, please? <laughs> yeah, well, me, I have, because I, exactly the same point mm. that Shirley has made, yeah. because I give a lot of money to people right. who don't have enough to eat and so on and so forth. And uh, I have looked for suttas mm. saying, share with, with people who are hungry and right. so on. Yeah. And I have not found one. So, I, I I am puzzled. I'm, okay. I can tell you one straight away. The one the 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 Buddha says, if you know what I know about the result of giving and sharing, you will not eat a meal without having shared it. Even if it was your last morsel of food, you would uh, you would. I think share it or give it to someone because sure. and then uh, share yeah share or give it to someone but because I know the result of giving and sharing um I have it, it, and then it repeats at that I have given and I have given my last I have shared whatever I have even if it was my last morsel of food mm -hmm. So right, you're right. very specifically right. something about about just I'll find it for next time. Yes, That's yes, yes. What I found. You it, it starts so with it starts with if you knew what I knew, the result of That's giving right. and sharing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. No, no, that is true because I remember reading it and I thought, oh, that's years ago, and say, do you know what I agree with you? That's what I do. <laughs> I speak to to the Buddha. He doesn't talk. Right, right. Oh, Sean, Sean says that it's uh, it's it's in this probably in this book if you look at the index. I mean, it's a very famous book. It's, it's about generosity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it, it is true uh, also that. Uh, sharing is not is well it is encouraged by the sutta but I think in the west if I compare to what I know of more Thailand and so on mm. we don't give as much mm. and um, I don't know if it's a tradition whether we are more selfish we are uh, but having said that uh, two weeks ago, I spent the weekend in supermarket gathering food for the charity I work for, for people who've got haven't got enough food, and I was absolutely amazed. You know, every time I do it, I'm amazed. You know how much people give, and then coming back, I thought to myself, you know, this is important for the food we've gathered. Of course, we need that food to then distribute, but it's also important 
to give people a chance to give. And sad, you see, the, most of them have got a big smile on their face when they give us a bag of food, you know, some rice or pasta or tins or shampoo. Or, and, and I thought, you see, that is not something to be missed. There are two sides to that, not only the food we gather, but the feeling we give to people, you know. And um, yeah, so that was good. Every time I do it, I think that's quite beautiful. <laughs> uh, it, it's very tiring day, but of a two days. But um, yeah, I think it, it is important. Uh, we we help not only the people who are hungry, we help the, the whole lot. And I will look for that sutta. Right, right. Derek will know which one it is. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, I think Sean found the page. It's on page thirty two, uh, in this book, and it's number five. Page, I'm gone. Yes. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's and the gift of food. Number two, this gift of food, and then the gift of dhamma. Uh, this, well, the sutta does it's from, doesn't have a name, but Big Bodhi has given it the name, the gift of food. It has a name. Yeah, actually, from it's a reference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. who but it has a name. Ah, there you go. Madeline says, Dana, one of the paramitas teaches the cultivation of generosity to all. Not so. It's food. The whole works. Can you translate this? Like, uh, what's it? I think. Um, oh, that's just the sutta reference. Yeah, I think yeah. it's the one sutta which covers all the different oh, right. aspects of generosity. Ah, okay. Here we go. Page thirty-one. Uh, ang the first one, miserliness. Anguttarika. It's called miserliness. Um, that apparently, according to Chi, covers oh. all the. Oh, okay, maybe I'm mistaken. No, she's forgetting another one now. Anyway, there but are a lot of suttas about yeah. generosity, Shirley. Oh, a section on generosity. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's got eight and fifty-seven. Yeah. After all, the yeah, the gift of dhamma is the highest gift. Sure. We have to agree, but in the meanwhile, people need to eat. So you are right, but in the end, we know that the gift of the dhamma is the highest gift. So we will, this is such a, this is, we will continue in two weeks time because it's eight o'clock. <laughs> so thank you very much, Venerable. It was such a wonderful discussion and I'm sure we will all wait impatiently for the next, next yes. session to continue. Yes. And thank you very much for these wonderful, valuable teachings, Venerable. And so, as you know, there's no Sutta class, a uh, Sutta discussion next week, and it's a big day for the, the Vihara to move into the new monastery. It's a big move, and uh, um, and it, it is a big thing for the whole community as well. It's very exciting, mm -hmm. and, um, and all your donations have, you know, made it possible, and uh, so we have to rejoice on that um uh, this this week next week um and um, um i would like to remind you about these exciting events in june as well um there are um ajan ramali's talks and the one day um one day retreat uh it is all in the events page in the anukampa project.org uh, and also there is an online retreat from, from by venerable uh, uh, Venerable Chanda as well as um, Ajahn Ram. So that is, uh, I think, three-day retreat in June as well. So go to the events page and you will see all those details. And uh, yes, we have we have moved to a big um, big vihara, but um, uh, 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 we welcome all your donations. And the big vihara is a very bold move. And from this small terraced house. Um, so uh, there will be things to do. Uh, so um, so I um, and and we talked about the generosity. 
Uh, and so this is this is a place to practice and um, you know how well we receive the Dhamma and how well we are guided and uh, if you are able uh, please donate to anukampaproject.org um, and with your donations all these all these um, teachings are offered to people free and it goes into the YouTube and many more people over many years will be receiving this Dhamma and if you want to get more involved, please email team at anukampaproject.org. Um, there's many ways of uh, getting involved. You can send uh, uh, send uh, food or needed items. You don't have to be in the UK or you don't have to be in the Oxford. You can do it online. So please um, contact team at anukampaproject.org uh, for any and, you know, they will explain you what ways you can get involved. And in the website, there is a page for needed items. And if you want, you can go through that as well. If you want to get, um, you know, involved in different ways, there are different ways to get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manori. Thank you, everybody, for that very rich discussion. And we will be here tomorrow for the Saturday class, Saturday meditation, but next Friday we will be moving stuff. Um, yes, so if you would like to uh, unmute and say goodbye and good night. Have a very nice rest, a nice weekend. Good weekend. <laughs>